to political correctness. And, you know, we deal with things in our workplace. We deal with things even in our own house. And sometimes it's hard, you know, especially with family. But uh, I'm hoping this morning that through this message, it, we can get the boldness to stand and do what's right. So let's just open up in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time that we're able to gather together in freedom. Because there may come a day that we will not be so free to gather in your name. So I just ask you, Lord, to encourage us this morning to stand for truth and righteousness in these last days. For as it gets darker and darker, our lights shall shine brighter and brighter. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to touch this morning on some different examples of people that have been sent from God to declare his word with boldness. And the pages of the Bibles are filled with men that were larger than life. People like Moses, David, and Daniel, and others. They all seem to be characters that are so far above the realm of our own experiences but they were just men and women, just as we are. When I read about the life and ministry of Elijah, I am amazed at his courage and the, the power that he had with God. And in James 5.17, we are reminded that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And in this message, I just want you to see that God can take a nobody and make them a somebody. God can take any life that will be totally yielded to him and will use that life for his glory. Elijah was a common man. His home was a place called Tishba in the region known as Gilead. It was a rough mountainous area known for its high peaks and deep valleys. The very name Gilead in its Hebrew form meant raw or rugged. This tells us that Elijah was a backwoods man. And when he stepped onto the scene and began his ministry, his methods, his mannerisms, and his message were as rough as the rugged place that he called home. Elijah's method of dress was as strange as anything else that we know about him, and you can find that in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins, and that was Elijah the Tishbite. <clears throat> we are giving an interesting insight into the prophet Elijah in the book of James. It says, Elijah was a, like, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And you can find that in James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. As one follows the life of Elijah, it becomes clear that he was a mere mortal. He was a man with a fiery temper who was prone to bouts of depression. But he also suffered loneliness due to the life of solitude from which he ministered. The emphasis here is that the Lord is not looking for spiritual giants to use for his glory. He is simply looking for a people who will readily obey his word and follow him where he will lead you. You see, nothing at all is known about Elijah until he steps onto the scene in the presence of King Ahab. He was a nobody from nowhere, but he was handpicked by the Lord God to do his will and to carry out his message to a wayward nation. 
God doesn't need rich, educated, or intelligent people of this world to get his work done. And we can remember um, King David. And you can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 through 7, and also in verse 12. And the prophet Samuel came to look at the sons of Jesse. And they were came and they looked at Eliab, and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. I believe that was the oldest son of Jesse. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on this countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So it's not always what we can see with our eyes, but the Lord looks at the heart. God has chosen to work through the lives of men and women who will simply yield themselves to the will of God and who will, like Isaiah, say, here I am. And you can see that in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. The bottom line is this. God wants your obedience to surrender to his will and more than anything else that you can give to him. So we see in the beginning of this message, Elijah was a common man, but now we see that he was also a courageous man. He defied a foolish ruler. The king of Israel during the time of Elijah was a man named Ahab. And according to the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and 33, Ahab was the most wicked king that ever sat upon the throne in Israel. And besides that, he was married to a wretchedly evil woman named Jezebel. She was the daughter of the king of Zidon. This too was an offense to the Lord. And you can see that in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. Jezebel was from a group of people who were ardent Baal worshipers, and she, along with her husband Ahab, did more to introduce the worship of Baal to the people of Israel than any ruling family. This produced a state of affairs in Israel where people lost all regard for the commandments of God. This is illustrated by 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34, where a man named Hiel the Bethlehite attempted to rebuild Jericho, and this was in a direct disobedience to a clear command of God. And you can find that in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Yet it was to this king that God sent the prophet Elijah, and Elijah walked right into the presence of King Ahab and delivered the message of the Lord without flinching. He told Ahab that there would be no rain or dew until he said that there would be, and it took courage to defy this wicked ruler. You see, the king in those days had the power to, well, power of life and death was in the tongue, and that was because the king had power to, you know, kill you. So it took some courage to stand before the, uh, the ruler like that and tell him, you know, what God had told him to do. Uh, so that being said, I would just like to share a little story here, and I think I've shared with this once before, but I'd like to share it again. Um, There was a pastor of an Orthodox Presbyterian church in the Sunset District of San Francisco, and he was a pastor there for over 20 years. And he had written a book titled When the Wicked Sees the City. And this man goes on that when he first met him, he was not, he, you know, he was thinking he was going to meet some great, you know, man of stature, just like, you know, the sons of Jesse, where all outward appearance, you would think they were, you know, a great man. And it wasn't like that at all when he met him. He was just a humble man of God. And his home had been firebombed. And the bedroom of his children, it was built like a chamber because of these firebombs. And, you know, he, he made it so that his children would be safe. And um, he made it like a bunker because he was being attacked at his house. And he was ministering a great deal in the hospitals of, of those dying of AIDS. Uh, 
but he was also standing firm for the truth and that um, he was, you know, telling them that the only hope beyond this life is, you know, to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he was telling a story of how he was sitting one day reading the newspaper and there was a council meeting being held the next day in San Francisco and he thought he'd go to the city council and he wanted to hear what this particular issue was about. It was a uh, about a homosexual rights issue. And he thought to himself that he just couldn't sit there and let that pass. So he didn't take anyone with him. He didn't take any signs, you know, like we see in some of these um, protests. Uh, he didn't march against them. Uh, he didn't you know, do anything that would draw attention to himself. Uh, because in his church services, many times they were interrupted by um, the lesbians and homosexuals. They would uh, interrupt his meetings. So anyway, he went to this um, town meeting and he sat there and he listened to the legislation and the council was about to take a vote. And the chairman said, is there any one among you that has anything to say? And no one moved. So he stood up and said, yes, I would like to say something. And he walked to the platform and stated his name, that he was a citizen residing in the Sunset District of San Francisco. So they asked him what he would like to say. And he replied, well, I would like to say nothing for myself, but I would like to quote three individuals that I've respected for years. And he read to them from Moses in Leviticus, from one of the Psalms by David, and one from Paul in Romans. He says that he didn't preach, he didn't scream, he didn't sermonize. He just closed his Bible and he sat down. And they said, wait a minute, before you sit down, who are these people? Moses, David, and Paul. And someone says, you're reading from the Bible, aren't you? And he said, <clears throat> yes, I am. And one of the council members then said that he voted no. And then another and another. And the legislation didn't pass, and he sat down. So it took him courage to do that, to stand before that council and stand for righteousness and truth. And so that legislation was not passed. So I think each one of us needs to show that kind of courage because America today is headed down the same road that Israel was back, back then. We have sacrificed our innocence for the pleasures of the flesh. We have openly mocked the written word of God, and I'm talking about America in general, I'm not talking about us here today. We have turned a deaf ear to the cry of the millions of the unborn. Who are slain in the name of convenience every year <clears throat> in this country. We have paid homage to the onslaught of sexually explicit program that invade our homes. We have sacrificed our morality to gratify our flesh. We have watched in mock horror as our sons and daughters yield their bodies to perversions of premarital sex, homosexuality. And lesbianism. <clears throat> We stand by in mute silence while the minds of our own children are captivated by the siren songs of prosperity, self-indulgence, and independence from God. We pass their choice of music off as a fad. We have no say in where they go and what they do. We have watched this once great godly nation become reduced to a stagnated cesspool of iniquity. 
open, open sin and outright hostility to God Almighty. After Elijah was taken to heaven in the whirlwind, Elijah, Elisha took Elijah's mantle and smote the Jordan and cried, Where is the Lord, Lord God of Elijah? And this morning I would ask you, where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? It's not always easy to stand here and say these things. He denounced the false religion. The crux of Elijah's message was that there would be no dew or rain until he said so. This was a direct attack against the false religion of Baal worship. You see, Baal was the Canaanite god of fertility. He was seen in the thun thunderheads and in the rain that fell. Baal worship was usually conducted on the tops of hills where statues of Baal were built. Typically, these Baal shrines were staffed by priests and priestesses, and worship was carried out through performing sexual acts with one of the ministers of Baal. It was their belief that when you were joined to a priest or priestess in sexual union that you were literally became a god or goddess for that time. One of the most horrible aspects of Baal worship existed in the realm of human sacrifice. When there was time of drought, it was supposed to mean that Baal was angry with the people. To get his attention, they would often sacrifice a firstborn child by burning it alive. It was a terrible religion that existed to gratify the flesh. And there is much more that could be said about Baal worship. But this is enough to see why it was an offense to the Lord God of Israel after all, it involved breaking many of the commandments, but especially in numbers, the, the numbers of the commandments 1, 3, 7, and 10, and you can look that up yourself. When Elijah made his announcement, he was declaring war on Baal. It took great courage to stand up before the chief promoter of that false religion and in effect say, my God is greater than Baal, and to prove it, God is going to shut off the spigot, and there will be no rain until I say so, and there's nothing you, Jezebel, or Baal can do about it. Again, it took courage for him to do that. Can you imagine how they must have laughed at him and mocked him? That is the kind of courage we need to see manifested in this day. This is the kind of courage that was derived from time spent with God, and from an angry indignation over the sins of the nation of Israel. This is the kind of courage that stands up against ridicule. It is the kind of courage that protests things like abortion, the homosexual agenda, the erosion of li li religious liberties, etc. It is the kind of courage that makes difference for God in these days of self-indulgence. It is the kind of courage that says, I will be different regardless of what it costs me or my family. I will stand for God. Are you filled with that kind of courage? Can God, God count on you to take the stand? And now we look at Elijah, who was a committed man. His very name tells his testimony. The name Elijah means my God is Jehovah. His name tells us that he had a personal relationship with the God of heaven. This is the first and crucial step in becoming anything for God. Until you know him, you cannot serve him. The only way to meet the Lord God is through his son, Jesus Christ. And you can see that in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. By walking into the presence of Ahab and Jezebel in the name of Jehovah, Elijah was demonstrated that in his life and ministry, he was totally dependent upon the Lord. He was not trusting in the arm of the flesh, but resting in the everlasting arms by faith. There is a huge difference. This is the secret of success for a child of God living in this wicked world. 
Only when we are totally yielded to God and total dependence, we can be assured of success. Faith. We must have faith. We must come to the place where we kick out all our props and rest totally in the hand of divine providence. We must come to the place where we stop trying and start trusting. We have plenty of people who live by their credit cards, their job, by education, and also by their ability, by intellect, although by whatever else. What we need is people who will live by faith depending on nothing but God to meet their needs and enable them to take a stand. Now we'll look at Elijah's devotion. Elijah was standing in the presence of the king of Israel. He was standing in the presence of one of the most powerful men of his time. Yet Elijah was able to see beyond all the trappings of the throne room of Israel. Elijah knew that he was standing in the presence of God. He knew that there was no need to try to please King Ahab, that there was no need to soft sell his message and make it more pleasing. There was only one person that, in that room who he had to please, and his name was Jehovah. You know, that is all the place that we all need to get in our lives. If we can get beyond what one person might think of us or what another might, person might think of us and live for nothing but to please God, then we are on the road to being used by God. Elijah was a man on a mission. He desired nothing less than carrying out the will of God. And one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, do we care what anyone else thinks about us as we take our stand for God? Do we, can we honestly disregard what anyone thinks about us, what we're doing to live for God? The attitude that we should have is total commitment. This is the attitude that God can bless and that God can use. Elijah was also a confident man. It, uh, Elijah believed that God was alive, as he said, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. Most other folks were living like Jehovah was dead. And it kind of sounds like the America that we live in now. Uh, I believe as time goes on, it seems, you know, things that happen at such a, such a rapid pace it doesn't seem like that many years ago that, uh, you know, things were doing, people were living lives that were right. People were going to church on Sundays, um, doing things more morally correct. And, in, you know, just a short amount of years, you can see where uh, mankind has come and some of the things that they're allowing that not that many years ago would, you know, would not be allowed. It's just such a rapid pace that uh, it's just hard to believe. I mean, I mean, when you think you've seen it all, you know, something else comes up that you say, "Oh my God," you know, where, where were these people coming from? You know, but this is the world we're living in, and we have to deal with it. So that, that's, that's why I'm kind of trying to get across to you that, you know, sometimes we hear things and we just kind of shrug it off, but it's time to take a stand. The idea of a drought was not Elijah's idea. It was, um, it was God's judgment at that time, and he was so, Elijah at the time was apparently so upset with the sins of the people that he began to pray that it would not rain. And of course the idea was put into his heart uh, by God, and as he prayed he received assurance that this indeed was the Lord's will. So he just marched up to Ahab and told them that it would not rain. 
And he did that in faith because he believed that he served a God who was powerful and was able to do anything. And one of the modern tragedies of the one of the tragedies of the modern church is a, a lack of respect for God and his ability. And I just want to remind you this morning that we serve a God who can do anything. He can meet any need. He can heal any disease. He can stop anything from taking place. He can cause anything to take place. He is a God and he is all powerful. Nothing is too hard for him. And I just, you know, want to remember that we should recognize God in every situation in our life, regardless of what we face. Now we're going to look at the promise of God. Elijah stood before Ahab because he had received a word from God concerning this matter. Elijah had enough sense to know that when God told him something, that it was going to happen, and it would happen. God will never, never back away from a single promise that he has made to his people. He will not desert you. He will not leave you. If he has made a promise to you, it will be fulfilled. So we are going to see that Elijah stirred up a hornet's nest when he made his announcements before Ahab. However, the point of this verse is that he stood and did what God had told him to do. Elijah was a man sent from God. He was sent to a wicked people to declare the judgment was coming from the hand of God. He was not afraid to speak up and to expose the evils of the day. He was not afraid to live by faith in the God of heaven. He was not afraid to put his life into the very hand of God and trust him all the way through. And I would just ask a question this morning of how many of us are like Elijah? How many of us are trusting in God, whatever may come our way? How many of us are taking our stand for God in the midst of this wicked world? How many of us are standing against the tide of evil of the world today? And how many of us really know God like Elijah did? We need some Elijahs in our day. Elijah's God has not changed. And where are the Elijahs who will believe in him regardless of the cost? When we look around at where things are in the world around us, the fact that things seem to be rapidly going downhill and the amount of discord in our society and the sin issues and all the lost souls around us, it can be overwhelming. And how do we take a stand for truth? How do we make a difference? There is a, a story that I'd like to share, and I know your, your husband has this book. And many, many years ago I had it, and I don't even... You know how I am, finishing books. I started reading it, but I didn't, I didn't finish it. But it's a story, it's a true story. It's about uh, a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany, and he stood against the Nazi regime at the time that uh, Hitler was taking over Germany. And what was so interesting about his life, that he was in a minority and even though Hitler was creeping into the churches, he, Hitler was rewriting the church doctrine. Uh, and it was acting like it was a Christian agenda. But basically, he was completely rewriting the Bible. And so many pastors, the majority of pastors in that country, chose to bury their head in the sand and look the other way, and no one would stand up against it. Well, this man Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the few that chose to write papers and start something that he called the Confessing Church. And only a small group of pastors and Christians joined the Confessing Church. But there were those who said, this is what real Christianity is, and we will not compromise on these points. As a result, many of them were tortured and killed. 
Yet when you look at all the overwhelming numbers of pastors and Christians who chose not to stand against Hitler and just remain part of the German church, and well, you know they went along with whatever he wanted to do, uh, which they wouldn't allow Jews into their worship service, and they allowed Hitler to rewrite the scripture, you wonder if they had taken the stand the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer did, could the Holocaust have been prevented? And when you look at the numbers of how many people stayed silent when they should have spoken up, it's a very interesting question to grapple with. Our culture has changed dramatically in the past few decades, and sin no longer happens secretly in the dark and distasteful corners of our society. Sin is now audaciously celebrated, it is proudly paraded, and it's aggressively legalized. Just because states and country legalize things doesn't mean it's right. Anyone who dares to express concern over our new cultural freedom is labeled a turncoat, a traitor, or a kook. These days, Christianity is only acceptable if it's passive, neutral kind of Christianity. Strong and bold, uncompromising, Dietrich Bonhoeffer kind of Christianity is rapidly, rapidly being branded as crazy, outdated, old-fashioned, and even dangerous. They say it's a crime against humanity, even in this country. They pressure to keep your mouth shut and allow sin to reign is growing day by day. These are the times we're living in now. Many of us can look back at the Holocaust and say, why didn't the thousands of pastors stay, stay, why did the thousands of pastors stay silent when such a horrible evil was taking over their country? But looking around at what is happening in our culture, we can better understand the pressure that they were feeling. There is an intense social and political pressure to remain silent against sin, lies, and deception, and it is present in every corner of our world, even in our churches. Several years ago, a woman and her husband were at an author's banquet of one of the biggest Christian publishers in the country. They had invited a lot of their top authors to this banquet. And they were sitting near the back, which they were glad of because they realized that every author that was getting up to speak at this banquet was an author that had written a very trendy, trendy popular book that went against the word of God. These are Christian authors. They were men who were saying that the word of God needs to be reinvented, rebranded, reinterpreted, in the light of our modern culture. Each of these men were well-known Christian writers and they were in favor of redefining Christianity. This is, this is what's happening today. Through their books and their messages, they argued that the Bible should be reinterpreted to comply with the, our changing culture and that Christians should be more accepting of all lifestyles, beliefs, and religions. For instance, they declare that any Christian who dared to call homosexuality a sin was not truly representing the heart of God. They stated that people can find God in many different ways through many different paths and that Christians needed to recognize the validity of other religions. It reminded them so much of Hitler's plan to reorganize the Christian church in Germany like the Nazis these clever, persuasive deceivers were calling Christians to take a vow of loyalty to political correctness and to disregard their loyalty to the teachings of Christ. When the speeches were finished at the author's banquet, all 800 Christians in the room... Okay, I have no idea. Did somebody uh, check that out? I think that one of the most prevalent attitudes in our culture today is, well, you know, and this is, again, the, the world that we're living in. Uh, God made me a girl, but I really should have been a boy. Okay. Or vice versa. God put me in this situation, but I, I should have been in another situation. So we rebel against God, do things our own way. We rewrite the words of Scripture to make it fit our own agenda, 
But in reality, as I said, God does not make mistakes. So standing for truth comes at a high price, and it shouldn't be romanticized. I mean, you can read stories about, I mean, Fox's Christian Martyrs, I'm, I'm sure some of you have read, but I'm sure some of you should read, because you see some of the things that these brothers and sisters of ours that had gone through years and years ago, burned at the stake, beaten, you, you know, uh, that's not very romantic. Uh, you know, it sounds like, you know, we can say, oh yeah, no matter what comes our way, we'll, we'll stand for God, even if it means being beheaded. Oh really? Are you sure that you're going to take that stand when the time comes? I mean, I mean even myself, I hope I can, uh, but we'll see when the rubber hits the road, if we actually will. So, by God's grace, I, I hope we can stand for the truth when it comes to that point. Uh, hopefully we'll be gone by then? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, men and women who boldly stand for their faith sometimes go down in history as heroes, but their moment-by-moment -moment circumstances are usually anything but glamorous, and what they're going through is usually very difficult. When Dietrich Bonhoeffer chose to stand against Hitler's persecution of Jews and control over the German church, he had to forsake popularity. He had to surrender the respect and admiration of his friends and his fellow pastors. He had to be willing to say what no one else was willing to say. Even as many of his peers walked away in disgust, he had to choose the applause of heaven over the applause of this world. And eventually it cost him his very life. Are we willing to make the same decision? The times in which we live are really not that tough, are not that far removed from the times in which Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived and countless Christian martyrs through the centuries have lived. Amid the comforts and pleasures and entertainment of our Western world, there is a terrible evil that has stealthily taken over it has taken control of our society and has bullied Christians into silence and created an open-minded society that accepts anything and everything except accountability to God. If you want to be loved and applauded, you have to obey certain rules like never speak out against homosexuality, just approve and applaud it. These are the things that they want us as Christians to accept. Be an affirming church instead of a judgmental church. Never say anything about abortion. Just mind your own business and let women take care of their own bodies. Never act like Jesus is the only way to salvation. People can find God through other religions like Buddhism, Islam, and Hinduism. Don't act like those Bible-thumping Christians who have an opinion about everything. Keep your mouth shut and don't take a bold stand on any point of Scripture. The German church was the vast majority of Christians who chose to remain neutral and passive towards Hitler's agenda, and the confessing church was a small minority of believers who refused to choose comfort over conviction. They stood boldly against the evil that was sweeping their nation, and many paid for it with their lives. So far in this country, standing boldly for truth is not leading to extreme persecution or martyrdom yet. But the decision must be made in our hearts long before it comes to that. If we're not willing to make smaller sacrifices here and now, like being willing to socially be rejected in order to stand for truth, then how will we be ready to give up our very lives for Christ when the real persecution comes? When Queen Esther came before the king with her request, the decision to give up her very life for her people had already been made. In Esther 4.16, it says that I will go to the king even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. We must have the same attitude just as the saints did in the book of Revelation who did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And you can find that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. So ask God for the grace to join the ranks of the confessing church even when other Christians choose the easier path. 
Though you may feel small, weak, insignificant, and fearful, his grace can shape you into a strong, courageous world changer, one step of obedience at a time. And I'd just take, like to take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, and also verse 19. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And this is the Apostle Paul. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth, mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Even the Apostle Paul, Paul, as bold as he was, asked God that utterance may be given him to speak, to open his mouth so he could speak boldly. So in closing, I'd just like to say that it's time to take a stand. And the question is, will you stand for righteousness and truth? Or will you bow down to the rod of political correctness? It's time to take a stand. So may the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, thank you.